Thank you for attending today's webinar on the systematic study of response factor variation for extractables and leachables. My name is Mark Jordy, and today I'll be talking with you about uh, ENL standard selection and its effect on quantitative accuracy. I'm going to compare and contrast three different methods of quantitation, and then I'm going to de um, describe what I call the relative quant problem and its effect on accuracy in extractables and leachables analysis. I'm then going to look at response factor variation for triple detection, including UV, CAD, and MS detection. And I'm going to compare that specifically for three different Ergonox antioxidants. I'm then going to describe some results from a larger study that involved 94 different extractables. So I always like to begin when speaking about extractables and leachables by describing what they are. Uh, extractables include a very wide variety of materials which can be um, leached out of a polymer system, including things like antioxidants, surfactants, slip agents, plasticizers, acid scavengers, cross-linking agents, as well as three very important classes um, which include oligomers, polymerization side products, and process impurities. I say these are very important because these latter materials are not put into the material on purpose and are generally not commercially available as standards. And this is one of the things that creates the relative quant issue. It's um, that you cannot buy standards for these compounds that you need to quantify in an extractables and leachable study. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to contrast three different quantitation methods. The first is internal standard quantification, which is a quantitation method in which we, we spike an internal standard into our sample and then quantitate all the species that we see relative to that internal standard. I'm also going to describe relative quantitation in which we're going to use a surrogate compound um, to analyze for one of the compounds under study. And we're going to do an external calibration curve in this case. And lastly, uh, I'm going to describe formal quantitation in which we use a, an actual reference standard of the compound of interest to quantitate these species. Now, before I get too far, I want to describe what I mean by response factors. Response factors are the signal strength per unit concentration that we observe for any individual analyte. And it's important to note the response factor directly correlates to quantitative accuracy. So when two compounds have different response factors, the quantitative accuracy obtained when we quantitate using one of those compounds as a surrogate standard will be adversely affected. In the figure that you see here, I show a target compound and a surrogate standard. And by looking at the slope of each of these lines, I can determine the response factor. If I ratio the slopes of the target compound and the surrogate standard, I can see that the ratio of those two slopes is equal to 0.58. That means that the calculated value, if I use the um, surrogate standard, will only be 58% of the true value because of the ratio of their relative response factors. And I also want to point out at this time that only linear detectors provide consistent response factors. If the detector is not linear, then there'll be a different response factor for each different concentration. Now, let's take a closer look at these. When we consider internal standard quantitation, again, in this method, we're simply spiking a standard into our sample and then quantifying relative to that internal standard that we spiked. And so uh, the equation we would use would look like this, where we would see that we have a um, a concentration of the internal standard of 25 micrograms per mil in this case, and we would ratio the observed peak area to the peak area for the internal standard of known concentration and use that to calculate the concentration of the target compound. And if we did that in this case, we get a value of 13.9. Now, the true value for this compound is actually 25 micrograms per mil because in actuality, both these compounds are at the same concentration. The difference in the observed peak height that we see here is due not to differences in concentration, but to differences in response factor. So if we use this approach, in this case, we would only get back 50% recovery of the true value for our target compound. Another important thing to consider when using the internal standard quantitation method is we do not get a, a, um, a measure of the limit of detection with this approach because we're only putting the internal standard in a single concentration into our sample matrix. We do not get to measure LOD. And so if we were to use the equation um, that I mentioned before, which is 25 micrograms per mil 
um, times the peak area of the analyte observed divided by 37.38. That equation can be used for any positive peak area, even if that peak area is not actually um, significant in terms of the noise of the chromatogram. So in this particular case, if I do a um, if I do run a low concentration, I can see that the in internal standard has a signal to noise of 10 to 1, while my target compound only has 5 to 1. And therefore, I'm not actually getting enough signal for my target compound to do an accurate quantitation. If I wanted to understand what um, peak area would be associated with a, a typical um, detection limit that I would want to apply in extractables and leachables analysis, something like 10 ppb, I can see that my calculated peak area would be 0 0.015. Now, looking at my y-axis, it's clear that that peak area is not significant in comparison to the background noise, and therefore, I could not actually detect at the level that is relevant toxicologically um, using this approach. So, um, in the absence of actual verification, this method effectively assumes an infinite LOD. Now, we can contrast that with relative quantitation. In relative quantitation, we're going to use a similar equation, except we're now going to include the intercept uh, and not just the slope uh, when determining the concentration of our species. And this becomes important as the peak area for the target compound um, gets to a similar magnitude as the intercept. So here's the uh, same example we did before. We can plug into the equation um, the peak area observed, and the, the, uh, the slope and the intercept, and we'll calculate out a value of 14.1. Again, the true value in this case is 25 micrograms per mil. And this again results in a recovery value that's 50% of the true value. In this case, it wasn't very significant to include the intercept because the intercept is actually much smaller than the, uh, than the observed peak area. But let's take a look at some other cases. Here we look at a whole range of concentrations ranging from um, resulting peak areas of 0.3 to 20. And we can see that when using the internal standard approach, we have a uh, re recovery value that's pretty typically around 50%. But if we do include the uh, intercept, we can see that the calculated accuracy improves as we get down to those lower concentrations because of the fact that the intercept is correcting for the, uh, the bias in the calibration curve. So in conclusion for relative quantitation, um, we, we note that if the response factor for our compound is less than the response factor for our surrogate standard, then we are not going to get a worse estimate of the concentration of our extractable, and hence we could be underestimating how much is actually present. And we would also be overestimating what the LOD of our method actually was, and we might not be able to detect at the toxicologically relevant threshold, i.e. the AET or analytical evaluation threshold. Now, for cases in which the response factor of the compound is greater than the response factor of the sta uh, standard, we would actually be giving a worst case estimate, and we would be underestimating the LOD of the method. Now, of course, the gold standard in quantitation is formal quantitation in which we use an actual standard of the compound of interest to quantitate. And this would be preferred in all cases if it was possible to get standards of all species, but it is not. And that's what causes the relative quant problem is the fact that we cannot get commercially available standards for all these oligomer side products um, and, and other uh, non-commercially available species that are found as extractables and leachables. But if we had a standard, as in this case, we can see that our quantitative accuracy is dramatically improved. We get back a 99% recovery. Um, and the reason for that is having a actual reference standard eliminates the response factor variation problem. So I'm now going to turn my attention to some work we did using a triple detection system. This system consists of a UV detector, a charged aerosol detector, and a QTOF LCMS detector, all in series. And um, the UV detector, when we think about its response factors, um, it is based on the principle of light absorption. So if a molecule has a chromophore, then that molecule will absorb light, and the response that we observe is proportional to the concentration according to Beer's law. Um, through the molar extinction coefficient and the path length, we get a, um, a specific response factor related to that particular analyte. Now, uh, some attributes of the UV detector include that it is highly linear, so we don't have to worry about variation as a function of concentration generally.
It is highly precise, so our values are very reproducible, generally less than 5%. It's not subject to sample matrix effect, which is a, um, a big advantage over LCMS where we can get large changes in signal strength, not due to um, changes in response factor per se, but due to changes in um, the competing process of the ionization of our molecule as compared to molecules from the sample. So there are no matrix effect in UV vis generally. And it's widely applicable. Most molecules have a chromophore of some kind, depending on what wavelength you're using. And lastly, we can typically get nanogram sensitivity, so it is also a sensitive detector. In contrast, the CAD detector measures species based on um, charge uh, that's on vaporized analyte particles. And so um, the response is proportional to the mass of the analyte that reaches the detector in any given unit time. It does measure all non-volatile species. Anything that will form a particle will be measured. Um, this detector is curvilinear. It's not strictly linear, so we will get some variation in the uh, response factor as a function of uh, concentration. It is also highly precise, typically less than 10%, and it is also not subject to sample matrix effects, typically. Um, it is widely applicable to almost all species that are non-volatile. Uh, it has nanogram sensitivity similar to UV. But it is affected by mobile phase composition. Um, if an analyte uh, is vaporized from different mobile phases, we'll get different kinds of uh, particles formed, and because of that, we'll get different sensitivities. Lastly, we have our ESI MS detector, our LCMS detector, this is electrospray ionization, and this measures charged molecules. So um, the response is proportional to the mass of analyte reaching the detector. However, this detector behaves as a concentration detector due to the loss of some of the analyte during nebulization. Um, it measures only species which can um, be associated with a charge carrier. So if the molecule has no header atoms, typically we'll get no signal. Uh, it is um, also a nonlinear detector. It gives a polynomial curve. And so uh, typically uh, you do need to be concerned with concentration in regards to the response factor variation. It has moderate precision at less than 20%. Uh, it is subject to sample matrix effects. You will get competition for analyte's ionization, and therefore you can get significant changes in response factor as a function of sample matrix. It is applicable only to heteroatom containing species, and it, but it's one of its big advantages is it has picogram sensitivity, and it allows for identification through the, the mass that's observed. So uh, it has a large advantage in terms of identification and sensitivity. All right, so let's compare now the response factors for three different compounds. These are all ergonoxes. Ergonox is a very important class of antioxidants, one of the most widely used, um, and they are um, in a lot of different polymer systems, therefore are frequently seen as extractables or leachables. Uh, these three compounds do have a range of molecular weights from 531 to 1177. Uh, they're all relatively non-volatile and have uh, relatively high hydrophobicity, i.e. a high log p-value. Here we can see the three chromatograms that are obtained from the UV in blue, the CAD in green, and the LCMS in red. And what we notice right away is that the UV detector gives a relatively consistent response, um, but there is some drop off for Ergonox 1076. The CAD gives a, the most similar response between all three compounds, whereas the uh, LCMS or ESI positive det mode detection, um, or ionization I should say, um, gives very dissimilar responses for the three compounds, with Ergonox 1010 showing very, very poor response in general. If we look at that in a little more detail, we see that for the UV detector, our response factors have values of um, 1, 1.08, and 0.58. Uh, that means that we would only get back 58% of the true value for Ergonox 1076 if using Ergonox 1035. Uh, we do see that the responses are all linear, and that the molar absorptivity um, basically determines the response factor. If the compound absorbs more, we're going to get a stronger response factor. And we, taking advantage of that, we also um, looked at the fact that if we ratioed the molecular weight by the number of chromophores, the resulting values could be used to calculate um, a, a value very related to the response factor. In fact, that ratio of molecular weights to chromophores um, gives values which were very analogous, um, 1, 1 1.09, and 0.62, which compare very nicely with the response factors of 1, 1 1.8, and 0.58. This, in, in an essence, could be potentially a method for predicting uh, response factors as long as the chromophore is identical, 
um, and there's no other absorbing regions in that particular molecule. In this case, this works because we all have hindered phenols, which are the same chromophore, um, and the rest of the molecule is basically not absorbing. Now, an important thing to consider in UV detection is wavelength. And in this particular case, all three of these molecules show similar types of spectrum, i.e. they absorb at similar regions. Um, and we can compare the, um, the response factors at three different wavelengths, 230, 250, and 277. And we see that they're very similar at all three because of the similarity between their overall spectrum. If, on the other hand, you had different shaped spectrum for different compounds, then response factor would vary potentially dramatically as a function of wavelength. And this would become very important. So knowing the UV spectrum of your compounds um, becomes important and you want to pick a wavelength at which you're getting absorption for both your surrogate and your standard. Um, ideally equivalent absorption. All right, so now looking at our CAD detection, we see that um, for our CAD detector, we saw response factors of 1, 1 1.5, and 1.6. So we're again off by as much as 60%, um, depending on which compound we're using as our surrogate. Um, and so we also looked at this as a function of concentration, and we found that in general, the, the variation was very minimal, so the designation of curvilinear was probably appropriate for this detector. We saw that for Ergonox 1010, the um, standard deviation was 0 .01, 0 0.06, excuse me. For 1076, it was 0.11, so again, relatively small variability, less than 10% in both cases, and so um, pretty consistent response factors. And that really, I think, partly is a, a result of the consistent boiling point for these two compounds. If we had one that was quite volatile, we might see a much larger change in response factor. Um, so knowing that your compounds are non-volatile is important when looking at CAD relative quant. All right, and lastly, we have the ESI positive mode LCMS detection. Uh, and we see that uh, in this case, we saw very large variability. In fact, um, the response factors vary by as much as 56 times. So we would get a very dramatic underestimation of the concentration of Ergonox 1010 or Ergonox 1076 if we were to use Ergonox 1035 as the surrogate standard. And um, this really is a result of the poor ionization and um, detection for Ergonox 1010 due to its relatively high molecular weight. This compound, as you saw earlier, had a molecular weight of 1177, so it's a relatively large molecule, and it's just not getting through the system well enough with a strong enough response. Um, in addition, it's, uh, we see that the curves are not linear. Um, and because of that, there's, you know, some variation as well um, in the results. That's a, an additional contribution from the nonlinearity of the detector. And let's not forget matrix effects again, because quant with LCMS is very subject to matrix effects. And you may see strong differences depending on if sample matrix components are colluding with the species being quantitated. Now we can compare the three different detector types um, looking at quantitation. Um, using UV uh, in micrograms per mil and the resulting calculated values, I'm sorry, the limit of detection. And we see in this case that the limit of detection by the three detectors um, is uh, relatively um, dissimilar in that we have low microgram per mil quantities for the UV and CAD, but much lower in general for the MS. That's one of the advantages of the ends. MS is high sensitivity, except for our Argonox 1010, which didn't ionize well. Um, in the case of our um, UV detector, um, we see that the LOD for all three compounds is relatively analogous because they all have a similar chromophore. In MS, we see point, uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.06, and then 1 because of the poor ionization of Ergonox 1010. And then for the CAD, we're again in the low microgram per mil uh, range in general for all three. If we compared the quantitative values that were obtained for each of the compounds, um, using different approaches, uh, UV, CAD, or MS. When quantitating Ergonox 1010, using Ergonox 1035 as the internal standard, we see we get a value of 5.1, 6.9, and then 0.1 using MS. That large error is, again, a function of the uh, large response factor variation um, for Ergonox 1010 by MS detection. In terms of using Ergonox 1030, uh, 1076 as the internal standard, we get values of 9.3 and 4.4, pretty similar for the UV and CAD, but 0.2 for the MS, again, um, very inaccurate in that case. Um, and lastly, uh, using relative quant versus Ergonox 1035 or Ergonox 1036, we get values of 4.9 or 6.2 um, and 8.5 and 4.2. Again, reasonably um, 
uh, consistent with the true value of five micrograms per mil. Um, still with relatively large error, but a lot better than what we see in the MS detection. Now in the relative quant, I'm using Ergonix 1035, because we have a measure of LOD, we can see that we actually are unable to measure um, Ergonix 1010 at 5 micrograms per mil because it isn't giving enough signal strength to even give sufficient signal to noise. So that's one of the advantages of the relative quant. It told us that we were actually below the, uh, the quantifiable limit there. Now, um, looking at our, our response factors um, uh, using a second instrument, we can ask the question, are response factors consistent from one platform to another, or do they also change as a function of the instrument? And in this case, we see that for a, a 1260 and 1090 DAD detector, we get very similar response factors on both detectors. So for UV in general, we didn't see as much variability, um, at least not across these two platforms. With CAD, um, we used two different models of CAD. Again, we saw relatively consistent responses. But with MS, we saw the most significant variability. Um, comparing a 6520 QTOP for 6545 QTOP, we saw a very significant improvement in the Ergonox 1010. And that's because the newer QTOP, the 6545, gives improved ionization for your Ergonox 1010, and hence we don't have as large a drop-off in signal, um, and we can get a less variability in our response factor. And I'm, I'm hoping that over in time, as, as mass specs get better and better, and we can ionize more and more of the compound that's actually being um, injected through the instrument, that response factor variation will actually decrease. So in summary, um, when we consider a source of, of response factor error, um, we see that for the MS, we have very large response factor variation. Um, up to 5,000 times has been observed in our laboratories. For the UV, um, it's generally less, although it can be significant, up to 200 times has been observed, and for CAD, 50 times. So it becomes important to choose good standards to minimize response factor variation. Otherwise, we can get very significant errors in our quantitative values. Matrix effects, uh, sample matrix effects are, are a significant problem in mass spectrometry quantitation, and so it's very important to have a way to gauge if you have matrix effects um, when doing LCMS uh, quant in general. And we don't have that issue with UV and CAD, which makes them superior detectors in that regard for, for relative quantitation. Our precision is also um, best for UV, uh, secondarily for CAD, and worst for MS. So that's another reason we prefer the, uh, the other detectors for quant primarily. And regarding signal drift, we have the most signal drift in MS as well over time. Lastly, um, and we didn't get into it in this talk at all, but ion selection is another problem you've got to consider when doing MS relative quant. Which ion addict are you going to use for your quant? You're going to use the hydrogen addict, the sodium addict, um, all ion addicts. You've got a questions you've got to answer there in terms of your relative quant because you aren't looking at the same ion as you would for a, a formal quant. So um, that is another problem with MS relative quant. And for these reasons, MS is just very problematic from a relative quant standpoint. Lastly, um, remember to consider UV wavelength when doing UV relative quant as well because that can also be a significant source of error. Now I want to present to you some results from our uh, preliminary study. We are actually in the midst of doing a, a large study in terms of response factor variation for, um, for a variety of extractables and leachables, but uh, this is preliminary data on 94 extractables. And we did this again using our triple detection system, both in positive mode and negative mode LCMS, uh, and using UV and CAD. And what we found was that when using positive mode LCMS, we were able to detect 80 of the 94 compounds. So one of the strengths of the ESI positive, um, ESI positive mode detection was it detected a lar the largest number of the compounds. Um, and we also found that 1% of the compounds were only detected by this mode. So if you didn't do it, you would be missing those compounds entirely. In terms of negative mode, we found that only 40 of the uh, 94 compounds were detected, so not as many. But importantly, 13% of the compounds were only detected in negative mode. So if you skip negative mode, um, you are missing a significant fraction of your compounds because those compounds were not detected by any other mechanism. UV was able to detect 44 of the, 50, of the 94 compounds at uh, 250 nanometers, and 1% uh, of the compounds would also have been missed uh, if we had not used this detection mechanism. And lastly, 53% uh, of the 94 compounds were seen by CAD, of which 4% of the compounds were only detected by CAD. Importantly, all 94 compounds could be detected by at least one detector if we used this triple detection combination. Without any of these detectors, we would have missed at least something. Lastly, if you found this talk interesting and you'd like to know more, we did publish um, 
early uh, in 2018 on response factor variation and its effect on um, the number of compounds that are identified during an extractables and leachables study. Our paper was entitled The Qualitative Assessment of Extractables from Single-Use Components and the Impact of Reference Standard Selection. And um, we'd invite you to, uh, to review that paper if you're interested in this topic. So with that, I'd just like to thank you for your time and your attention and for attending today's webinar.